you ready? Here we go. Revelations 3, 14. Did you see, see that dynamic in that voice? Does that sound like an old preacher? Revelation. Okay, here we go. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, right? These are the words of Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one of or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Holy Spirit says, church. Let's stop. I want to go through this, and the reason is this. There's too many words that are so powerful, and we're gonna miss it if you, please, pay attention to the words. He starts off, these are the words of the amen. The word, amen means so let it be. What he's saying, Jesus is giving the revelation to John, John is writing it down, and what Jesus is saying is, I am the absolute. I am the so let it be. I am the amen. What is coming out of my lips because of the cross and the resurrection is truth. It's going to happen. And therefore, what he's saying is you need to smarten up and pay attention because what I'm saying, and he's saying this to Laodicea, and he's saying it church on Queensway, he's saying it you and I, you need smart time. But then he goes on and he says, the faithful and true witness. In other words, I've been faithful and I am the true witness watching you. And then he says, I'm also the ruler of God's creation now because the cross, the resurrection. Then Jesus goes on through Revelation. He says, I know your deeds. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one of these. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Let me just stop and say this to you. The longer you are a Christian, the easier it is to fall into being lukewarm. When I was in grade five, my teacher was teaching about boiling water, and he said it has to boil at 100 degrees Celsius, and I didn't believe him. And so I took it up to 96 to prove him wrong. Now, we had bubbles in the bottom, but we didn't have boil. And he said, Richards, when are you going to listen to me? Take it up to 100 and you'll get boiling. And then he said, by the way, you can't go over 100. And so I put three Bunsen burners under that baby to take it over 100. And guess what? It wouldn't go past 100. Oh, there was a lot of steam stuff to this. But at 100, it boiled. When I took it down to 98, it stopped boiling. It's the craziest thing. My science teacher was right. Only thing he was right about. Can I just share this with you? Are you lukewarm? Jack Hayford, pastor in Anaheim, uh, California, um, a great man of God who has influenced me greatly and, and I, spoken in my life so many times when we've been together. We're having supper one night and he said to me, Billy, it is harder to be a Christian in the United States of America and Canada than it is in a persecuted country. And I looked at him and I said, what? He said, no. He said, when you're in a persecuted country, you know you have to live for Jesus that day or you're gonna get snuffed out. When you're in a persecuted country, they can take all your money, they take your house, they take everything. You, you know you're one inch away from being held into a concentration camp or being martyred. Whereas here in Canada and the United States, we have incredibly a lot of stuff. Let me just share this with you. The majority of us, matter of fact, all of us, have more than half the world. Some of us are gonna eat two meals, some of us are going to eat three meals, and they're gonna be different meals. Majority of the world eats one thing, maybe twice a day, but it's the same thing. For some of us, we eat two meals, three meals. My friend Chuck, he eats six meals a day, but we won't talk about that, it's under the blood of Jesus. 
can I just talk to you about this? You're neither cold nor hot. And then he says, and I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And somebody says to me, where does God's spit go? To hell. Goes to hell. <gasps> you shouldn't preach this way. People don't like it. I don't care. I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. And then he turns around, and this is the craziest part. Are you ready? He says, you say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need anything. The church in Laodicea, they had houses, apartments. They had uh, a transportation. They had everything going for them, okay? They, and here's the crazy thing. They, they, it wasn't they were rich because the majority of you are not rich, okay, just like me. But the fact is they had enough that they could live without God. Illustration, are you ready? A lot of us, we don't care, we don't need divine healing because we have OHIP. I mean, when was the last time you were asking God for shelter? Or you're asking God for a piece of food? If we have problems with food, we go to a food bank or we go to the government of Canada, especially during election year. I mean, the craziest thing is this, people are destitute. Do you know that in downtown Toronto, and God loves these people, and I'm not putting them down at all. The street people in Toronto, the city of Toronto is helping them by putting them in hotel rooms in downtown Toronto. And the hotel rooms are making a big buck every day off them, and that's taxpayers' money. I'm, I, whether it's right or wrong, I'm not concerned about that. What I'm saying to you is this. It, it, there, when you're in a persecuted country, you know you need Jesus. I mean, when was the last time you were starving for Jesus? I'm not talking about hungry. You were starving. You couldn't make it through another minute without Jesus. When was the last time you hungered and fasted and prayed because you needed Jesus? You gave up a meal, and I'm not talking one meal. You gave up many meals because of Jesus. And the fact is this, that a lot of us, we, we, we haven't made. We have enough money we're gaining. We have a nice little apartment. We, some of us even own a car. Some even own two or three cars. You know that the majority of the world doesn't have more than one pair of shoes? And, and what is it, 20% of the world doesn't even have one pair of shoes? And yet for some of us, we got so many pairs of shoes, it's ridiculous. And what he's saying is, I, I, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Well, and then he turns around and Jesus says, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Did you hear this? Why? Because the fact is this. You think you have everything, but you have nothing. On Thursday, I did a funeral for a 95-year-old man. I do, I do this every time. I, I think I need to stop doing this. As the family walks away from the casket, I always check the casket, make sure there's nothing valuable in it. Because it, wh why would you put it down in the ground when you could give it to the family and let them use it for missions or something like this? You can't take it with you. And for some of you who say, yeah, but when I'm gone, my children are going to thank me. How are they going to thank you? You're gone. So what he then goes on and he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined. How do I buy something from Jesus? The Bible says in Romans 12, present your body as a living sacrifice. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your wealth. He doesn't want you trading something. You know what he wants? He wants you. You. When he has you, then he will get tithe. When he has you, he will get stuff from God. The point is this. He needs you. He needs you. And he died on the cross and rose again for you. For you. See, he can make the money. He can make anything you give to him, but he wants you. 
And then what he says, I counsel, uh, I, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined. What is gold refined? Gold refined in fire is holiness, righteousness from God. And then he goes on, so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover up the shameful nakedness of trying to do things without God. And then he goes on and he says, and salve to put on your eyes so you don't see what the devil has clouded your eyes with, but you start to see what God wants to put in you and what God needs to take out of you so that you can be hot for him. The other night, my, my beautiful wife, she was cooking a turkey. We were gonna have people over. And, and I don't know why we were having turkey, but the fact is she was cooking a turkey. And she said to me, can you check the turkey? Now, how many of you have this problem? You wear glasses, and when you open the oven, the steam comes out, you can't see anything, right? Okay, so she says to me, so what does the turkey look like? I don't know, my glasses are all steamed up, right? And I go, oh, just one sec, I had to take my glasses off. The, my fog of my glasses was stopping me from seeing what my wife wanted me to see. Here's the craziest thing. The salve of God is where the Holy Spirit comes in and takes your blinders off. The things the devil has blinded you with so you can see what God wants you to see. Then he goes on and he says, To those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. And then he goes on and gives us the application. Let me go through the application because the application has changed my life and it continues to. Number one, he says, be earnest. You know what earnest means? Be so sincere, be so starving for God that God is number one and people see it. The fact is, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek. But watch what it says. Are you ready? He says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. How do you get to God? Through faith. When you, have, when you earnestly seek him through faith, it's not through works, it's through faith. Yes, your works will show your faith, but when you seek him through faith, and here's the craziest thing, when you're so pick and hungry, you're starving for God, you start to earnestly seek him through faith, faith from your heart, and your actions and your words will show this, all of a sudden God will start to touch you and God will start to bless you. And this is what, what, what he says to the church in Laodicea. Number one, are you ready Laodicea? You wanna get hot? Here it is. Get earnest for God, sincere, so sincere that people see you're starving for God. God is number one. God is number one. Then he goes on, number two. He says, when you're earnest, he says, I also want you to repent. And what does the word repent mean? Not only you ask God to forgive you, but also repent where you turn from your wicked ways and you start to become hot. And here's the key to repentance, change. It's where the Holy Spirit, and I say this, it's not where you're changing yourself, but where you and the Holy Spirit are working together and you're changing. And people start to see, this is is your thermometer of life. People around you, non-Christian and Christian, start to see you're getting hot for Jesus. People around you start to see you're getting hot for Jesus Christ. I love Hebrews 4, 16, it says, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. In other words, let us have faith when we approach God's throne so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. What is our time of need? We're starting to get lukewarm. We're starting to get lukewarm. We're starting to get lukewarm, so what do we do? We approach the throne and God gives us grace. What is grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. And we, his mercy and his grace. And the Holy Spirit comes and helps us to be hot. Helps us to be hot. I love this. So he goes and he says, he says Jesus says there's three things to be hot for Christ. Number one, be earnest where the world sees you are starving for God. Number two, repent, and the world sees you are changing through the Holy Spirit. Then he says, number three, open the door. Somebody says to me, how do I open the door? 
open the door to the Holy Spirit. A lot of people, they open the door to the Bible. A lot of people open the door to prayer. A lot of people open the door to worship music. But the fact is this, here's the key, is to move beyond that, move across the bridge where you open the door to your life to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me to be earnest where I'm starving for you and people see it. Help me to be so earnest that when I'm repenting, you show me not only how to repent, but you help me repent so that I change. And, and you open the door. And you keep opening the door. The longer you live for God, the hotter you get, the more the door opens. And you keep opening the door. Matter of fact, I don't want God to just open the door. I want him to blow the wall down. I mean, we have to come to a place as born-again Christians where we are so hot for him that people around just go, whoa. Whoa. One of the greatest men that has had a tremendous influence on my life is Pastor Jim Simla, Brooklyn Tabernacle uh, in, in Brooklyn, New York, right across the bridge from Manhattan. Jim Simla's church, Brooklyn Tab, started having revival. People started getting saved. I mean, people just walking off the street saying, I just had a revelation of Jesus Christ on the street, coming in and said, I need God. I mean, people just start coming, coming, coming. And all of a sudden, before he knew it, his church is full, full, full. He had five services a day. He didn't know what to do with the people. And all of a sudden, he started to pray. He said, God, you, you call me to Brooklyn. You call me to see people come to know you. You call me to see the sick get healed. You call me to see the drug addicts get delivered. You call me to see the alcoholics get delivered. All this stuff, Lord, we need a place to minister. And all of a sudden, God showed him an old theater in downtown Brooklyn. In downtown Brooklyn, an old theater, and I forget how many million dollars, something like 17 or 20 million dollars, and this is like 20 years ago, okay? And, and, and God said, that's yours. And, and Jim Simla, with love unto the Father, says, I don't think you saw the price tag. <laughs> and God said to him, if I have gold streets in heaven, do you think 17 million is gonna be hard? So Jim Simla, are you ready? He comes to his congregation and he shows a picture of the theater and he says, now most pastors like me who are shallow, I would have just taken an offering. You know what Simla says? We're gonna pray the money in. Did you hear this? I mean this guy is so hot for Jesus. I, I mean when I'm around him you just feel Jesus. And, and all of a sudden, the congregation started praying night and day, 24 hours a day, they had prayer chains, pray the money in. And all of a sudden, the money started coming from all over the world. People were dying all over the world, sending money to Brooklyn. I mean, people who never even knew about Brooklyn said, uh, the Lord just told me to send you money. And all of a sudden, cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. And they buy the, the church, but now it needs to be renovated because the city of New York says it, it's fire hazard. You gotta rebuild it inside. And all of a sudden you got a bunch of million dollars. Watch this, 30 days before the opening of the church, millions and millions of dollars they've spent. 30 days before they're about to move in, the construction company in New York City says if you don't give us a million dollars in 24 hours, we're going on strike and you'll never get in the church. Are you ready? I love this. This is a man of God. Instead of going to his congregation crying, oh, the construction union here in New York. You know what he did? He said to his wife, don't interrupt me. He went into his bedroom for 12 hours, shut the door, took some water in there, and he started to pray for 12 hours. You know, the Bible says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. When God tells you this, right? What's Psalms 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of Sheph, I fear no evil. Why? His rod and staff are there to comfort me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. Well, here's the point, Lord. The construction company in New York is pretty strong. Let, you gotta help me here. They, uh, we we wanna open in 30 days. You told us this is our building. The money has started coming in. We don't have another million dollars. And all of a sudden, the Lord starts speaking to him in 12 hours. He walks back to his church 12 hours later. The staff are waiting for him. Uh, it's late at night. And the, he walks in. He says, don't worry about it. In 24 hours, we'll have a million dollars. And they said, well, shouldn't we take an offering? He says, no, the people have given enough. 
And they said, well, where's the million dollars coming from? God. And they said, yeah, we know that, but like uh, God and who else? And he says, I don't know, God. Next morning they wake up, two rich guys show up, don't attend his church. God woke us up last night. Here's a check for 500, here's a check for 500,000. Thank you very much. And walks over to the union and says, here's your million dollars in Jesus' name. Enjoy it. Here's the craziest thing, are you ready? The Bible says signs and wonders follow them that believe. A lot of churches today are watering down their theology in order because their church isn't growing. So what they're doing is making the door a lot wider. Jesus says the door to God is very narrow. What did Jim Simbola do? He earnestly sought God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He earnestly sought him. What did Jim Simbola do? He started to repent. Lord, if there's anything that's standing in the way of this opening, the like union, I ask you, forgive us. Lord, help us receive. And when you repent, then God blesses. Did you hear this? When you don't repent, there's a curse. When you repent, there's blessing. And what happens is this, he, he opened the door and he just started believing. Lord, you call us here, you told us this is ours, therefore, Lord, we need you to help us. And the Lord came through. Can I just share this with you? Don't you water down your Christianity. Don't you water down, because when you start watering down Christianity, and I say this to the church across Canada who's watching today too, when you start watering down your theology and you start watering down your Christianity, the fact is this, you're not going to win, you're going to lose. If there's anything the church needs to be, is hot today. Churches across Canada have compromised. They have given in to peer pressure. They've given in to social pressure. They've given in to pressure all over. And these churches are empty today because they haven't stood for the word of God. We need to stand for the word of God. We need to obey the word of God and we need to be hot through the word of God. And that doesn't go for just the big church, it goes for individuals in the church. I ask you, and I pray that you get hot, just like I need get hot. You can never be too hot for God. Did you hear this? You can never be too hot. My wife, she was cooking turkey at 325. I said, you know, if we turn it up, it'll cook faster. She said, you turn it up, it'll burn. And you'd never be too hot for God. Can I ask you something? Honestly, are you lukewarm? Are you lukewarm? How many of you, I've had a bad week. How many of you had a bad week? Just raise your hand, thank you very much. Two people. I went to a Christian conference in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I hate Christian conferences. But the board of directors wanted me to go, and out of respect for them, I went, and they sent Pastor Roger and Pastor Ed to make sure I attended. <laughs> I went dragging and screaming and kicking. In this conference, I'm sure they mean well, but the fact is this, all I could see I didn't see us getting hot. I saw us getting lukewarm. And I sat there frustrated. I sat there frustrated, and if they would let me speak, I would have spoken, but they wouldn't let me speak on most stuff. I mean, the Christian church today is lowering the bar instead of keeping the bar high. And you know, if you study the New Testament, people say to Jesus, when they go to judgment, they said, we cast out demons in your name, we heal the sick in your name. And Jesus says, I'm sorry, I never knew you. But Lord, I attended church on the Queensway. I was in the worship team, or I volunteered in children's ministry, or I was an usher, or I, I, you know, I was with Hope on Wheels helping needy people. And Jesus says, I'm sorry I never knew you. Why? Because you were lukewarm.
And somebody says to me, what is hot? Are you ready? When I see hot, I look at the book of Acts. People healed. People filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. I see people in, in the gospel where they lower a man through the ceiling with faith and Jesus heals. I see in the book of Matthew, Luke, John, and, 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 and just incredible where people walk on the water, the dead rise. And somebody says, well, that, that was the dispensational for that time, not today. Are you nuts? My Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, I was at that 95-year-old funeral. This guy's 95 years old. And I was standing at the casket, and I was thinking to myself, Lord, tell me to walk around it seven times or three times. Who cares? Let's get this guy up. And then I thought, no, that's not fair to him. He's 95. He'll, tick, he'll be ripping ticked with me. I was in heaven, and you brought me back. What is your problem? I'm 95. But can I just share this with you? People who are hot in God want the book of Acts. People who are hot in God want Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. People who are hot in God aren't going to water it down or go fuzzy or give itching ears where I'll just please you in order to make you happy so I can sell a book. Bible says, take up your cross daily and follow me. It's hard to be earnest. It's hard to repent. It's hard to open the door, especially in Canada. We don't need God in a lot of ways. We have food. We have shelter. We have job. We have a government who will help us if we don't. But Jesus said, man, you're missing out on the whole thing. You're looking at the temporal instead of the eternal. You're looking at your God is how much money you have or how wealthy you are or how good am I when I retire instead of looking at the big picture, eternity. And Jesus says, hello, knock, knock. Guess what? If you're lukewarm, you're going to go to the same place the cold go. And I'll trust when you get there, you will be hot. And when I'm reading this, I was just shaken to my core because I said, God, help me to be more earnest for you. Help me to starve every moment of the day to have you. Fill me. May the door be so open. I, and Lord, help me to continue to repent so that you change me. God doesn't expect you to be perfect. But God does expect you to be earnest, continue to repent where he can continue to change, and every day open the door more so that he can continue to work in you. I'm scared for the church in Canada. I'm terrified. In my opinion, it's going down the drain we need a Holy Spirit revival where we get back to the book of Acts. We get back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We get back to seeing the lame walk, demons come out of people. And this only is going to come when you and I cry out to God and say, make me hot. Make me hot. Make me hot. You will never get hot on the coattails of a church. You only get hot when you're in the Holy Spirit. Let him touch you.